as well as been doing some work um, recently on that front as well. So again, thank you so much for, have, uh, for having me and happy to be here. All right, thank you, Brian. O.C. Um, like Brian says, thank you for having me. It was well, very honored to be here, be part of this. Uh, hopefully, as was previously stated, this can be a continuing or ongoing situation um, and everyone can come get involved, talk, discuss, especially about the experience at University of Windsor and where they are today. Uh, like my name is OC. I grew up, actually I was born in Hamilton, very close to Brian actually. Um, <laughs> Moved to Nigeria when I was four, grew up in Nigeria for a bit, came back to Canada, back again to Hamilton, um, University of Windsor, uh, did track and field there, very deeply involved in sports when I was out there. I graduated computer science and business, also went and got my uh, Bachelor of Education there, thought one day hopefully I would end up being a teacher as soon as I've had kids. You know, they have the greatest uh, holiday, so you gotta join <laughs> that situation at one point or another. Um, Currently, I work for the federal government, quite enjoy the job. Uh, it's led me to a few places. I first, when I originally began, I was in Saskatchewan for three years um, and then managed to transfer back to Windsor and start life all over again. Got married, had kids, and now I'm here. <laughs> Fantastic, thanks, OC. Tamara, hey, tell everyone who you are. <laughs> hey, sorry about the technical difficulties. I don't know why the uh, link wasn't exactly um working for me so I apologize and sorry for the delay. Uh, I'll make it really quick so we can make sure that we have time for speaking. Uh, my name is Tamara Lopez. I am a graduate at the University of Windsor. I went there from 2000 to 2004, graduated with an honors degree in psychology with a minor in sexuality studies and I also now work for the federal government and been doing that now for over 16 years. I've been able to use my degree uh, in other parts of my job, as well as part-time. I was professor at Sheridan College part-time, as well as Humber College part-time teaching in their police foundations program. So it's been a really uh, great like degree. It's taking me places. And I had, uh, again, a great four years when I was there. So we can get started. Dwayne, thanks again for having me. And thank you, University of Windsor, for having the event too. Thank you, thank you. And then I'm Duania and I'm gonna serve as your moderator, but I wanna be part of the conversation too, right? Because we're all talking. And I went, I, I don't remember when I graduated. 2011 was when I applied to graduate. Let's be clear on that one. <laughs> <laughs> My friends did bring that up like, mm, no. I applied to graduate in 2011. I have a degree in chemistry and one in political science. I am using my chemistry degree, love it so much, but I want to dive right in. And before I do, I wanna let everyone know if you do have questions, the Q and A function is working. So you are able to type your questions there. And um, yeah, feel free to type questions to any of our panelists. Now we can dive in, but first we need to do a little check-in because I want to know how you are all feeling because we're in a pandemic, it's Black History Month, there has been the Black Lives Matter movement. How are you feeling? Like how are you really feeling today? And how are you really taking care of your mental well-being right now? Uh, I'll, I can kick off there. Um... Personally, uh, especially in the kind of few um, early months of the pandemic, just kind of like uncertain, unsure, um, you know, just kind of, I don't want to use the word loss, but just a million things happening at once. So it's kind of hard to keep everything straight. Um, as of like, you know, the last few months, sometimes a little overwhelmed, uh, just a little bit, uh, you know, constricted, um, especially with, uh, with my work. I'm used to working later nights, events million things happening. So it's been a, a, a massive adjustment, but uh, in terms of caring for mental health, just um, always trying to do a reset of the, uh, a reset of the mindset, uh, just, you know, keeping everything in perspective, um, you know, keeping the loved ones close and uh, just understanding where, uh, where you kind of are in and it may get overwhelming, but you can still make differences, make changes, no matter how grand or how, um, how small they can still take an effect. True, true. Surrounding yourself with loved ones can be the key if, you know, if you're able to do that in a time like this. Uh, OC, what, what are you doing? How are you doing? And what are you doing to keep <laughs> <laughs> The start of this, probably everybody is the same situation where you're just, you're scared, the confusion, the fear of the unknown, I think was a major, biggest part of it, especially with a family. And then as soon as more research starts going on and they start telling you how it affects African-Americans more than it affects other races, it affects people who have health conditions, which you just you just have that massive fear. 
And then with federal and government, with our jobs, we didn't have the luxury of not going to work. So I was still going to work every day, still functioning as if everything was, I guess, not okay, but you're still working. So that kind of helps you a little bit mentally, even though you still have that fear, you still have that um, responsibility of waking up every day, going to work, your responsibilities of work. And then just the family, family is a big part of it. I do miss a ton of my family. A lot of mine moved to the U.S., so I have not been able to see them in basically over a year, year and a half because of all this. Uh, but I have my wife and I have my daughter and they're a big part of keeping me mentally sane. And then physical activity, we were fortunate enough to build a gym before all this hit and before gym equipment was out of the roof. So every time I smile because I got mine at a reasonable price. <laughs> <laughs> That's forward thinking right there. <laughs> Tamara, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing all right. I um, had a father. Uh, my father actually is still alive. So he, I have a father in a nursing home, and he unfortunately did get sick with uh, COVID uh, last year uh, in beginning stages. So in mainly the month of April, he was sick. Uh, that was really a, a tough time because there was a possibility that I may never see him again as the nursing home was in lockdown. And he may not have made it. So it was a really uh, interesting time to be in and I wouldn't be able to go to see him or whatever would happen. And my mother was still working part-time in nursing home and then there was an exposure that she received too. So it was really hard trying to juggle that. And then I also was still working. So I had to leave my house and the fears that would happen because I had to go into work, be around people, come home and then have to worry about my parents. So it was, the nice thing is that a, a, an app I had called House Party existed. So I was able to be on House Party with my friends, which was a lot of fun. I learned what Netflix was uh, actually. And I also learned what a book was again too. And some and baths are always good. Uh, I wish that I kept with the physical activity. I started out so good at the beginning and then motivation went out the window. So I need to find that again somehow, but I think we are now that we're going to a different stage. So it has been, um, a very interesting time, just trying to find ways to take care of yourself and manage everything can be overwhelming at times, but I, I think that we're all doing pretty good by finding comfort in friends and uh, fr um, family and others. Yeah, I think the common denominator definitely is having that support system around you and finding, finding back those little hobbies that you used to like doing, like reading, <laughs> like you reading. said, go figure. <laughs> All right, we did a little check-in. Now, I want to know, like, tell everyone a little bit about what your early years were. You know, what was your upbringing like? I did hear Brian and O.C. mention growing up in the Hamilton, well, being born in, in the Hamilton, Ancaster area. Um, what was it like being Black growing up in those areas? What, what, how did you feel, or when was the point where you noticed that you might be a little different than others. I don't know who wants to start, if I should go backwards or whoever wants to jump in. Sure, right. go backwards, I'll start. All right. Uh, I grew up in a predominantly uh, white neighborhood when I was living in Downsview, Ontario, which is now part of North York, which is part of Toronto. So I was in a very Italian neighborhood when I grew up. And I think, like, we didn't really talk much about color until I moved to Mississauga. And then I, I started to realize that I was a little bit different. And I don't think that there was a lot of diversity that went on in that town at the time in the, uh, my gosh, like late 80s as I date myself here. Uh, so I think the one thing that really stood out was one time we were playing with some hand puppets and the hand puppets had Velcro and someone must have thrown it at me and it got stuck to my hair. And with Afros at the time is what I had my natural hair, um, Velcro sticks to our type of hair. So then all of a sudden everyone trying to come after me with Velcro puppets, just trying to pull my hair out. And then that's why I started to notice that it wouldn't stick to anyone else. And then it was like, look, look, weirdo, you stick to Velcro. And that's when it was, I was probably in grade five at the time. And that's when you started to really notice that there was a difference. Something so trivial still sticks out because I, I have Velcro as part of my job and I'll still get stuck to my own clothes, uh, which makes me laugh. I'm like, oh yeah, I remember those times. Five. <laughs> Velcro. <laughs> I'm gonna look at Velcro differently now. <laughs> right, right out, I'm serious. Like your hair will get stuck. Oh my gosh. All right. Wow. Five. That's, you know, that sounds pretty young for most people to. No, I was in grade five. So I'll probably like 11, 10. Okay. Okay. All right. That makes, yeah. But it's still a little traumatic because then after that's what they would do at recess, which she would chase me with Velcro puppets. Oh my gosh. Wow. Um, Osi, what was it like for you? 
Um, I, my situation, I, I was born in Canada and then moved to Nigeria. So I was around a lot more Nigerians and came back to Canada when I was about nine. So this situation ends up, it, there's a lot to it because I guess my first encounter would be while well, coming right from Nigeria and coming to Canada, predominantly white neighborhoods, same as Tamara. There was probably, let's say, those three, two other um, black people in my grade at that time, possibly five in the entire school. So at, at that point, it was like, oh, well, you have to date the one. There was only one other black girl in our grade class. So I was like, you guys need to date the one other black girl in your day class. And my real first experience of it, it was, oh, you grew up, oh, did you come up, did you, were you raised in jungles? Like, I did track and field, so like, oh, did you race cheetahs when you were growing up and lion? Oh, that's why you're so fast, it's because you were running away from lion. Like, that was, that was just the viewpoint people came at, and that was in grade three. And actually, the one point that I do remember that really sticks to my mind till this day was uh, during recess uh, at a point, there was a, like, a white kid who was running around and recess had just ended, and um one of our responsibilities was like gathering everybody together to get in line to go back to class after recess. And I still remember to this day, this kid looking out that looking up at me and being like, don't touch me, Brown guy. And I'm like, Hmm, interesting. Like he would, and he, he just, he was younger. So he probably didn't understand the difference of what he was saying because his first perception is just the color of my skin coming at him to tell him to get back in line that recess was over. But to this day, that point actually still sticks with me that I, I will always remember that. Wow. I still trying to wrap my head around that. Did you yeah. cheetahs? Is that why you're so fast? Yes, you heard that a lot. Right? You probably even probably athletes now will probably get that viewpoint when you're from it, it's even nationally they'll still make viewpoints like that. Kenyans are fast because they run barefoot in the jungle on hard surfaces. So it's a viewpoint, a stereotypical viewpoint that's put out there, but it's somewhat of a, a norm that isn't perceived as being, well, racial. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is why we have these conversations so that everyone can pinpoint all those things that you probably said that you shouldn't have, that you won't say going forward. Because- Yeah, you hopefully you never say it again. Will, yeah. will have, right? Um, Brian, what, what was it like for you? So um, for like similar to a lot of uh, my uh, friends here on the panel, uh, I was raised in a predominantly uh, white neighborhood uh, in Castor. So um, for pretty much, I would say elementary school, middle school, and for majority of high school, I was pretty much the only black guy uh, in my school. Um, you know, there may be one other for one of the grades. Uh, so so in terms of like the term of like, when did you kind of like know you were different? I, I would say almost all my life, uh, pretty much uh, anytime you got that uh, class photo, <laughs> you know, you just got me smiling in the, in the corner and just, you know, you look different. Um, and so like, there's a difference between um, when I knew, like kind of felt I was different, but when it started becoming more apparent, if that makes sense. So like, you know, I didn't really encounter a lot of things, um, you know, necessarily in elementary school, middle school, a little bit, um, but uh, it's kind of interesting with, Osi's point in terms of the, um, you know, the athletic and then those very, you know, insulting questions. I, <laughs> I hope there's not too many of my friends on here, but I, admittedly, cause I'll never admit this to their face, but I was not the most athletic. <laughs> I'd like to think that I was, I was very competitive, but I was not the most athletic. And so when that came into being, that's when I felt the reverse of that. Why am I not the star? Like people would le legit ask me, why are you not the star on the basketball team? Why are you not the star of the of the soccer team? Like, you know what I mean? It's just because like, aren't you supposed to? Because my older, I had two brothers, and you know they were better at uh, sports, uh, uh, a little better than me at sports and everything like that. And they were like, you know, fairly athletic, um, especially my older brother growing up. But they were just asking like, you know, why why are you not the best basketball player, or like, you know, how are you not the fastest on the team, or or what have you? Um, so it's just um, it, that started coming into a, a parent uh, more so in in middle school and in high school. Um, <laughs> there's even just in the back of my mind the story of <laughs> I rarely even said this story to be completely honest of I feel like I made the football team one year because the teacher passed me in the hallway and asked why I didn't try out <laughs> so um, never saw me play anything like that but uh, that's that's just the, the in the back of my mind nothing uh, more so came from that but uh, it's just that's what some of the things that I felt and that's when you kind of noticed that you were different um, it also kind of like started in elementary school because when you would have um, attendance lists uh, I had my middle name on the uh, attendance list as well. So I'm from, I'm Ghanaian descent. 
And uh, OC, I was going to bring up too, because I saw you have, you're Nigeria. So Ghana will always beat Nigeria in, in football and in soccer. So we'll get that later. <laughs> but um, Man, we're staying out of this. <laughs> but uh, the reason I bring that up is because, so my Ghanaian name is Kofi. And so that was brought up and a lot of kids were pointing that out. Like, you know, not being malicious, but you know, making fun of it because it's something they've never seen before. And so, you know what I mean? And so that's what I really kind of felt that happened around like, you know, in elementary school as well. So that's when you really became a parent and then just kind of grew from there uh, as I got older. So Brian, are you born on a Friday then? Uh, yes, I am. <laughs> okay. Wow. And, and yeah. I, yes, it's Friday because the other- I Yeah, Kofi, it with me Kofi and my brother, for so. like, I believe Afifia is the other female version or something for yeah, Friday. Uh, yeah, yeah, for Afifia, yeah. Yeah. And it's funny because I also, when I was in school, people automatically assumed that because I was black and I'm also really tall, about five foot ten, would be amazing at every single sport. And I cannot. <laughs> if, if I am left handed for one. And I feel like I have two left hands and two left feet. So I tried out for, for volleyball. I tried out for basketball. I played football, tried boxing. Nothing. I, I'm a huge nerd. That's what I'm going to do because I, I can't. But everyone's like, well, but you're black. I thought you would really be, really be good at this. But I'm like, we're not all born athletes. Exactly. I mean, I have the total opposite experience from you because I grew up in Jamaica and just predominantly Black, and I didn't have that big moment until I moved to New York. I was 10, and my mom took me to get me registered in school, and I was supposed to be going to the eighth grade, but because I was 10, they wanted to put me in the sixth grade, but I was not going to go back to the sixth grade. So we compromised on the seventh grade. And not only did they compromise, but they put me in the slowest class ever because they just figured I didn't know what I was doing. And they didn't care. They didn't want to test me in another class, nothing of the sort. And after a couple of months, my mother had to go down there and like let them know this is not acceptable and she fought for days before they had to bump me up but I sat there for a couple of years and didn't learn anything but that's when I had to like my parents had to start giving me that reality check of this is what the real world is like outside of Jamaica especially <laughs> you're going to have to now keep your eyes and ears open because someone's always going to try to make you feel like you're less than that was my aha moment and you know, that's our early years. I know we, we have, I wanna leave time for Q and A, but I really wanna talk about our University of Windsor years, you know, some fun <laughs> times. Cause you know, your, your college years are usually your best years because that's where you find yourself. That's where you make some lifelong friends. And that's where you really figure out what you're gonna do when you really have to go out into the real world, right? What was it like on your first moment on campus? How did you feel? Overwhelmed. Right? Why overwhelmed? Did you, well, I had to leave home and it was like my first time away and you're gonna be away living in like residence. And it was just this whole, I mean, I was 19 at the time, but it was still a huge thing. I never left my mother's house and to go several hours, like four hours down the 401 and they were like, what is this place? It was uh, a new, a whole entire new, a whole new world is basically what it was <laughs> when I got there. It was just overwhelming. Uh, but if you had met Tamara, you never would have guessed that, though. Well, I fit in really quick because my hair was blue. One, and one of the best time. personalities, yes. Oh, thanks. For for me, it was um, it was free. Uh, there, there's a there's a level of freedom, um, and so what I mean by that is that uh, you know I, I I I did the extra year of high school, so you know I kind of feel like I was um you know you know in the oven too long, um, so before I took on uh, heading to university, but it was the um, aspect of freedom because with Windsor. Uh, again, it was like, you know, over about three hours where I grew up, but it was also just the fact of meeting a lot of new people, but also I knew that we had a, a larger percentage of, of international students. I knew that there'd be more, you know, there'd be more black students, um, you know what I mean? And just different people. Um, so, I mean, like when you're in a small town, like nothing disparaging against my small town, I, I did love where I grew up, but it's just the idea of actually being open to that. Now, I'm not about to be naive and say, oh, discrimination just stopped when I came to university. But um, it's the fact that uh, it, it was the opportunity to just see new people, see new like experiences and relate to people differently than when I did at home. 
Definitely, definitely. Um, anyone else? Did you feel like you, well, there were more Black people at the University of Windsor than in some of your towns. I do understand that. I know for me, some of the people I roomed with, I was their first Black friend. They were from very small towns. And when I started in Windsor, I started in January. First of all, I didn't know that wasn't a thing in Canada because in all the schools in the US, you can start whatever semester. And I had to go through interviews with deans just to be able to go, it's okay. I'll take the second half and then take the first half after. I'll figure it out, I'll figure it out. And you know, also a fish out of water because I just moved to Canada like two months before. So to get used to that Canadian experience and everyone like in the morning knocking on your door, we know you don't have your ID yet, but we can take you to breakfast. And I'm like, I don't know you. <laughs> Give me a second, please. <laughs> right. But it was really cool to see some like to meet other people on campus. And it was a large black community on campus. Were any of you involved in any organizations on campus? What were you involved with? Uh, I was, <laughs> it's funny that we have Barb on this call too, because uh, she's just gonna be like, you better mention every single one of them. Um, so <laughs> I was on, uh, I was on our Commerce Society for Business uh, debate team. Um, I briefly was with our Human Resources Association, our Marketing Association, um, as well as um, SIF, uh, which is um, like, you know, kind of like the independent and like small business uh, group within the Odette School of Business, which eventually became Enactus. I was one of the presenters for some of the projects we were doing for that group on both the uh, regional and then the national level. Uh, so I was presenting there. Um, I believe I also did, um, uh, I was a student recruiter uh, briefly as well for while I was in while I was uh, still in university and then briefly after I graduated for about four to six months. Um, and uh, I think that is everything. But uh, so I was in, so throughout like my four years, I was um, a part of just a variety of different uh, different groups and then either on a presenting side because I loved doing presentations, loved talking, loved doing that kind of stuff. So that's what kind of got me into a, a lot of groups. Nice. Nice, that's quite the list. Uh, I, can't compare, I can't compare to you. I mean, I even though I have like my awards in the background, like first year student year awards, and I <laughs> volunteer of the year award, apparently I'm like outdone by okay. So I was an RA for a few years. So a resident assistant in the uh, university in Laurier Hall and McDonald Hall uh, did that. I was also on student council as a first year representative and then a second representative. And I was on that for my four years while I was there. I also uh, founded, co-founded with uh, someone from CJAM because I also volunteered on CJAM, the radio station on campus, had a radio show there. Uh, we did the out on campus. We created that group for any uh, LGBTQ2 plus students that were on campus. So we did that, had a space in Dillon Hall, uh, did some stuff with so Soda, I believe it was called, which was a Society of Dramatic Arts. Uh, I was also part of stuff with them. Uh, I wasn't really into like the same day. I, oh, I was the mascot for the school. I can say it now because I no longer wear that costume. But I, when they first created the Lancaster costume and I wore the Lancaster costume at like the homecoming game. And then I got sent to the hospital. Um, because of the costume was way too heavy for that degree of temperature that was outside and I had a heat stroke. And so I got sent to the hospital, it's quite interesting, but it was really fun. It was fun wearing the, uh, the Lancer costume for a while. So I, I did that, go that's a, Lancers. That's an amazing <laughs> list. I don't know what you're yeah. talking about. That's yeah, a that's very long list. list. Right there. <laughs> what you have, OC, what do you have? Yeah, he's only I'm got all kinds of these awards two. and... <laughs> I only did one thing. I competed track and field at the University of Windsor. It was, I mean, one of the greatest experiences. And my family members, those, those are the guys who actually got me to break out of my shell, who contributed to the person I am today. Not without one of those guys would I be anywhere, do anything that I, I have been able to accomplish today. Like some of the all-stars that would put you in your place when you think you are the greatest thing in the world. You have Jamie, who's world champ, like went to world championship. You have Kurt Downs. These guys, if you think you're cocky, you're great. They won't hesitate to put you back to where you really, where you really should be at. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the family thing, I mean, University of Windsor, um, the guys I got to meet through the University of Windsor, I, I, the only word I can use is family. And these guys, these guys are with me when I went there and these guys are, will be with me, hopefully will for sure be with me when I, when I pass away. And um Again, if we're looking at Black History Month, they, the guys I mentioned, they end up, it just ends up, I end up 
migrating to them. And it's not just the color of the skin that migrated me to them, it's the people that they are. And even the track and field team, it has nothing to do with the color of your skin when you're on the track, right? It all has to do with that migration of the personalities. And the personalities that all gathered on that team, they just, they fit so well together to create that aspect of a one team, one goal type origination, which is, it, it helped me fit in better at where I was. Um, I might be leading towards other topics or you lose a little bit of your self identity in some of the areas we grew up in and growing up in Ancaster and Hamilton, 100% predominantly white neighborhoods, predominantly Italian, predominantly sports like hockey. Like you lose the person, you start losing the person you are. I remember one day my sister came at me and was like, Hey man, like you seem sometimes you're uncomfortable around black people. I'm like, yeah, well, like I'm in a school filled with all white people, like everything I'm growing up, everything I'm seeing in my life is all white. So how am I supposed to feel comfortable around black people when I, I don't really experience or see this? And then as I slowly started growing up, I started getting around more black people and you, you just start getting more awareness of the person you are, the person you are. Like I'll even throw a random conversation that I had with one of my coworkers one day out in Saskatchewan. Uh, she's Chinese and, I, and we were just talking about, that's where I almost got that, that identity loss from growing up in Canada. And I was like, hey, like if you could, like if you were anything else other than being Asian, like well, she, she, like I was like, would you rather be white or Asian? She goes, I'd rather be white. And I was like, whoa, like that threw me completely for a loop because I was like, I don't think I could ever say that. But I, then I went back to when I was younger and I was like, you know what? I probably, yes, it was probably a point in my life. Yes, I would have said that. I said it when I was younger. Why yeah. wasn't I white? I asked my mother that Mom's, question. She yeah. was brought when I said that to her in the kitchen. Because I'm like, well, it just seems like it'd be easier. Yeah, and that was her answer too. She said it would be easier and it's, it would be easier for her. And I was just that, I was very surprised. And this is, I'm not even talking about a younger person. I'm talking about a full-fledged adult working. <laughs> and, and I'm really glad, uh, OC, you brought that up. Not to, to, to derail too much here, but um, I, I definitely agree of the, um, just kind of the identity lost um, kind of feeling you get. Uh, because, you know, uh, when you're, when you're constantly in spots where you are the visible minority, um, oh, it, it, yeah. you you feel almost like an overcompensation to adapt. Um, you know, you code switch like there's no tomorrow um, in a lot of cases where, you know, I can already say for myself how I would see how I'm different amongst, um, you know, the parents of some of my friends, like, you know what I mean? Or some or some new people who are, who are white who I've just met compared to, to friends of mine who are white that I like you know, known for years compared to my family, compared to, you know, friends of the family. And, and you just kind of like, you, you feel like it's that what you're doing and all the switching is part of you, but then you realize, well, that's a, that's a conglomeration of everything. So it's not really me. So what is me? And so that's a kind of like um, the, the difficulty that you kind of, um, you face, not only just um, growing up and like, you know, uh, for us here who have been in predominant white neighborhoods, but even when you get into the corporate world, when you get into that next level, like you just, you ask yourself, okay, rather than what is me and how do I apply it here? It's like, what do they want me to be perceived as? Like, what should I, like, you know, can I, uh, can I say like certain terms or something like that? Or can I bring up certain issues or, 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 you know, even bring up certain articles? Like, I mean, um, like any time, and this can even go back into high school, anytime I saw that there might be some sort of unfair miscategorization in the media of a black athlete, for instance, I bring it up and it's immediately, oh, you're going to bring up a race car. And so you, you don't even feel like you're comfortable to even bring it up. And that's been said to me numerous times growing up. And, and so it's one of those things that you try to adapt to, but you also try to like, I'm glad you're starting to see a little bit of progress on yeah, I've been told that too. Like, if you want to get ahead in life, I have to try and not be too black wherever I go. So if it's like changing my voice to sound more like a white individual, um, not bringing like all of my parts of myself to my job, or even like something as silly as if I'm uh, even certain food that I eat and I'm at work, someone's like, what make what she asked me, what do I put in my food to make it stink so bad? And I'm like, it's called seasoning. Oh. <laughs> uh, this was like a couple of years when I'm at work and I'm thinking well I don't ask you why is your food so bland but it just it came out of nowhere like she felt the need to ask me why is my food safe she's like, then she's like is that African fish and I was like a I'm Jamaican b it's chicken 
Like, do you even have <laughs> nose that's working? Or if I'm dancing somewhere, I have to make sure, oh, I'm at a certain kind of like wedding. So I'm going to do a different kind of dance. So someone doesn't have heart failure. Cause like, oh my gosh, is she twerking? <sighs> so you have to just, a lot of it, you end up like muting or bringing only parts of yourself that I think would blend for. So we're like chameleons all the time. When we go to certain events and certain functions, like, oh, how are you, sir? And how you have to present yourself to not come off as being, I don't know, assertive or aggressive. Or scary, as uh, you know what I mean. Or, yeah. you know, like, or, and it's funny you bring up like even the dancing thing too, because like you know I love dancing at weddings. Me too. Like and it's just that, but it's like it's that you can either you know give them heart failure, or you're the one who stands out as the overly exuberant. Yeah. The, um, you, you know the, the the Sammy Davis Jr. kind of thing, um, uh, like <laughs> uh, like you know the caricature, and and that's the issue too, because it's not only just like the afraid of being. Um, uh, afraid of being yourself because like what they might think is but it's like it's how you come across as well and how are you remembered and then how are you perceived months later and, but at and what that's... point do you feel okay to just say this is me and I'm just going to be myself do you feel more comfortable doing that now yes uh it's taken me some time to have to go through different parts of my life and become more mature and even just realizing history uh realizing that yeah i've muted myself for a very long time like i felt free uh brian when i was in university like i had blue extensions and i was able to be like wild and crazy wear all kinds of awesome outfits and it was amazing and then i had to mute myself when i got into a profession uh where you have to kind of like toe the company line and be a certain way uh and then even like when i go to like the holiday parties because they no longer call them Christmas parties I had to still be careful like the dance moves I'd bring the sugar daddies I couldn't bring to say a work party and then I was like you know what fun this idea if I'm gonna they're gonna know me as a person I'm going to be the wild and crazy individual that I've always been so then I come in with the outfits they're like what are you wearing because I went in the Santa suit one time and I was like isn't it Christmas <laughs> but no everyone else is like in prim and proper clothes and I walk in in some Santa suits Okay, wow. Uh, We're going to definitely get into some of those things in the workplace, but I have one more University of Windsor question to ask. Well, maybe two. How did you find out about some of the organizations that you were a part of? Because there might be some people who will watch this in the future who want to figure out how do I tap into them? Like, I know for me, I was a part of NSBE, Natural Society of Black Engineers. I was an OR for a couple of years only because the first year I was an OR, I loved it so much. And it took great joy in me to tell some of these parents not to write those kids those checks that they were going to spend downtown instead of on buying books um, <laughs> that I had to do it again. <laughs> so how do you find all these organizations to be a part of? How do you get more involved while you're in school? Club days was the thing for me when they had it with UWSA. So all the different clubs and societies and organizations that existed on campus, they'd all be there in the, the common area of the UWSA and you could actually walk around and see. Like I found out about that one Caribbean association that would always plan the sports weekends. I'd heard about them also from the club days. That's probably the best way to do it. And that was a like very ingenious idea for the university to have. How do I get involved? Come find out. And you still can be involved, obviously, like if you're a graduate, like the Alumni Association has been amazing to, to me in my experience as a previous board member. So you can still stay involved with the school because I have such a big part of my life was from there and it's given me so much. I always take the time to give back to the school. So through Alumni Cares or whatever opportunities they have there. So I did stuff while I was there through the Club Days events. And then after the fact, I'm still involved. Um. Yeah, for me, it was um, it was the Odette School of Business itself, uh, because, um, you know, I found that a lot of um, professors as well as, you know, um, administrative and and um, and like recruiters and everyone like that in that work within the, the business school, they really want engagement because that's what they it's almost kind of interesting business schools like compete against each other. So, you know what I mean? Like the more engagement we get, the more new ideas we get and the more we can stick it to Ivy or like things like that. So, um, so for me, it was like, you know, for instance, again, Barb's on the call. She was um, uh, very big and like, you know, getting myself as well as other students into things um, as well as uh, Carrie Gray, who, who was working there too. So that's how I kind of got into it. We also had club days, but it was just, there was a lot of just like, oh, we're doing this or we want to do this, or we think you're going to be a good fit here. Like try it out. And also I was always the kid in class. I asked a thousand questions. I was always talking. I was always trying to spur a debate. Hence why I eventually became captain of the debate team, because I just, that, that's all I did anyway. <laughs> Might as well do it in my spare time too. <laughs> oh, wow. 
Um, so my last University of Windsor question, I want to know because from my personal experience doing chemistry, I don't think I encountered any non-white teachers. Well, my last year, I think I did have one Indian teacher, but I did have one professor who to this day, I still credit in helping me get to where I am. So Dr. Dutton, that's my guy, okay? That's my guy. And I was very thankful that I was able to thank him to his face a couple years ago before all this you know, pandemic stuff happened. Uh, but do you have a professor that you feel really helped guide you through the University of Windsor process? Dr. Jill Jackson, Dr. Ken Kramer were uh, my psych professors, and then Dr. Barry Adam, who was uh, instrumental in our uh, LGBTQ2 plus uh, uh, club. So he also taught gay and lesbian studies on campus, and that was uh, a huge, huge eye opener. So those three for sure. Awesome. Uh, OC, you want to go ahead? <laughs> I, I was a lone wolf at that point, so no, I just got in the business program. There, the program I was in, there weren't many black people in it, really. I think there was two or three others in the program. Professors, I don't. I'm pretty sure there was none. A lot of the professors, because it was computer science, computer science mainly when I started. Business later on, some computer aspect of things. There weren't a lot of really, it was, you go to class, you do your programming, you go home. Yeah, so it was, uh, yeah, I was a lone wolf, I'd have to say at that point. When okay, then to, what about, uh, okay, oh, well, then what about coaches? Because for you, as part of like the amazing yeah, record, you be a, yeah. inducted into the uh, Alumni Hall, uh, Sports Hall of Fame recently, congratulations. So what about Thank any you. sort of like coaches then? <laughs> I, well, we had, well, everyone knows University of Windsor, Dennis Farrell, I, you can't say or do anything without track and field without that name of Dennis Farrell being thrown out there. The guy was a legend. He helped a, a lot of um, individuals within there. Honestly, a lot of it came from the other athletes. It's that, that whole aspect of it. I, I like Kurt Downs, Jamie's, um, I root like Vernon's people. I was lucky enough to be surrounded by some very intellectual, hardworking individuals. So I, I never had to look up towards professors or coaches to inspire me to move on. I just had to look at the people who were standing next to me to motivate me to move on. And those are the guys who kept me motivated. They needed, I needed them, they needed me. It was like, if you fail out of school, see, I will kick your butt. And I was like, okay, I'm not gonna fail then. I'm not gonna fail. <laughs> you didn't have that luxury of like, messing up and then you didn't track it so much sports took so much of your time you didn't have time to procrastinate either so it was a great thing it was I had to get my schooling done I had to get the practice I had to yeah back and forth back and forth <laughs> for um for me um, I, I didn't have too many um you know uh, black uh, um professors or, or anything like that but uh, I will say there was like a number of not only just a and men within the Odette School of Business, but professors. So for me, it was Dr. Francine, Dr. Francine Schlosser. Um, so uh, she was like part of like our leadership program and whatnot. And the great thing about uh, with her was that she, it was the little things. Like, you know what I mean? Where it's just like the little things are just like, how do you properly like present? How do you properly like convey confidence when you're doing your presentation? Things like that. How do you sell an idea? How do you lead a team? Uh, so that was like something like that. Um, Dr. Vincent Georgie, um, who actually recommended me for this uh, panel itself too. Um, he was like our, our faculty admin for our debate team as well. And he's just, and you really can't go through Windsor without knowing the name of uh, Dr. Uh, Vincent Georgie. So uh, him as well. So, and Bob Barone, Kerry Gray um, also just helped me like kind of guide me um, through all the clubs and managing my time and making sure that like, you know, I'm getting the most that I can out of the school, as well as uh, Dr. Jim Marsh, who was the faculty admin for Enactus, and just kind of um, made sure we just kept doing the projects and going from there. So those would be the uh, the five I would. Kind oh, of and actually, I forgot to add too. A former University of Windsor president, Dr. Ross Paul, was actually instrumental a lot in my four years there too. And another amazing woman, uh, Susan Lester from the Alumni Association too, who was really uh, a, a great mentor and guide and encouraged me to run for the board after I graduated. So uh, amazing people. 
Wow. So those are some names we all need to jot down because we have to send some <laughs> additional thank you cards, you know, thank you everything mm -hmm. because they helped guide us to where we are today. And that's part of the power of the University of Windsor, the faculty, the people, the people you've met along the way, uh, which I'm sure a lot of you still have close friends from then. We all do. Um, but now in your work life, you already started talking about a little bit about, you know, having to code switch or feeling like you have to code switch. How is it like when you're out in the real world? Like, let's talk about interviews. I can still remember doing an interview for a company when I was totally desperate for a job right outside of Windsor. And this guy for the entire interview kept saying how you don't sound black. You don't you you sound you sound educated and just kept thinking it was a compliment because well, I'm just not who he thought. Well, Duania, my my last name was McClarty, so he had no idea who I was going to be, and I was the only one in his waiting room, and he was looking around for someone who would fit the bill of Duania McClarty when I'm the only one sitting there. I mean, I got the job. I told him I didn't want it because I was not that desperate, but. <laughs> <laughs> like, I have a firm rule. I will not work somewhere where I feel like I'm going to be disrespected because my mother's my mother is not going to make me suffer. So I will just wait. Thank you. And 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 sorry, I don't mean to cut you off there. Just to for code switching for anyone who might be watching might not know the full meaning of that. It's just kind of like changing um, how you speak, how you present yourself to a variety of different kind of people um, in different situations, like because you're a fear of how they might perceive you because of your skin color, because of your background. Just, uh, or you have to be the representation <laughs> for all people who look like you. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, how's it been for you in that aspect in terms of interviews and just getting started in the workforce? Uh, go ahead. <laughs> I'll, start, I'll start one off. Uh, I'll be, uh, I did move to North Carolina for one year and I'll specifically remember I was work. I did computer science for a company and the one day I decided, let me ask the boss this question because I had dreads and I was interviewing a lot of companies in the U.S. I know it's not, well, whatever, Canada, U.S. Um, but um, I was getting turned educated. Like I have my computer, I have my business degree, I have a computer science degree, I have my MBA, I am a bachelor of education. I'm coming at you with a full resume when I come to an interview and I had dreads and I'm getting turned down for jobs. And I'm like, when I go into interviews and I know the person I am, I am at interviews. I'm really good, great sometimes at interviews and I couldn't figure it out. So I cut my hair, went to this interview, got the job about four, five, six months afterwards. I went to the boss and I was like, we were just talking, eating lunch. I was like, if I had come to this interview with Dredson, would you give me a job? Even knowing the person I am today, he said, no, I wouldn't have given it to you. And uh, yeah, he was just, he was flat out honest about it. He, I was like, even knowing the person I am, how I work, he goes, no, I wouldn't have given you the job. Wow. And then wow. even, even now I'm like, I would love to do more with my hair. Actually a few, I could talk to a few uh, police officers, um, blacks who are police officers, blacks and other jobs where you're still hesitant to do certain things with your appearance because of how the public, your coworkers and other people are gonna look at you. There was a point this year, I was like, maybe I should grow my dreads back out. But then I look around and I'm like, I won't be, uh, what I want to accomplish with my career, I don't want something as simple as the way my hair has been perceived previously or how it can be perceived in the future to be what prevents me from where I want to get to. So you're, I'm stuck in that situation where I, I have to keep my hair low-ish and I'm, I'm just not going to do dreads because or braids because of that hesitation. And that's unfortunate because I had a similar incident too when I decided to get my dreads done uh, in 2008. I was just talking about it openly and I was approached by one of the members of senior management asking me to submit a business case to her uh, to give me the reasons why I would like to make an, a permanent alteration in my appearance that might not comply with my workplace's uniform policy. And I sat there thinking, can they ask me this question? I didn't say I was going to have my hair like in a mohawk that was lime green. And I'm like, well, when I'm at work, my hair gets pulled back in a ponytail and that's what it says in the policy. It doesn't state that I couldn't, like if I had extensions, it wouldn't be a problem. But for some reason I said, I wanted to go natural. Uh, well, I need you to put that on paper in a business case so I can approve or disprove. Well, I don't need your approval. You know, my mother. So I decided to forget the business case, 
And I got my hair done in dreads anyway. And now I'm, I've had my dreads since 2009. And I was like, wow, your hair is gorgeous. Is that real? And I'll get other random questions too, but I'm thinking, had I said, yeah, I'm too afraid to, I'm not going to do it. Where would I be today? I, I had to take a stand and say, that's kind of ridiculous. You don't have the right to tell me what my hair is going to look like. So I would say, OC, do it up. Because another coworker of mine in Toronto, he cut his dreads off too. I was like, nobody, I'm starting a trend. Grow back. <laughs> uh, I, I'm in a slightly different kind of um, uh, situation. Like scenario just because of when I, I pretty much was working here at MLSE essentially right after school it was about like six seven months after so I only had like a couple of interviews my biggest thing was just never getting even like that first interview or that first um, idea through the door um, what I can say is when I was interviewing it was for the Toronto Marlies uh, which is our um, our development hockey team so safe to say I was feeling very um I don't want to say uncomfortable, but, and I also don't want to say unprepared, but just didn't feel like I thought I would fit. And, and so that was kind of bothers me where it's just going like, cause you know what I mean? Like I, when I went there and again, nothing against MLSE at all or anything like that. It's just when I went there it was me and one other young lady um, who I went to university with, we were the only two black people there. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and it's a hockey team. <laughs> so, I mean, like it, it's a, it's a minor hockey team. So like, I mean, obviously like that's, that's what some people would um, kind of assume, but I mean, it's just the fact of how, I did not like that doubt uh, that I had in my head. I didn't like that uh, feeling of just because I'm not like some white dude who played hockey growing up that I couldn't sell hockey in Canada. Like, I mean, it's just the idea of that kind of silly notion, um, but it happens. And then that's the unfortunate thing. And it's just, a, it's the constant roadblock that you have to kind of like, you know, surpass yourself when you're going into the corporate world. Even, sorry, writing out what Brian was saying, my name. <laughs> right off the bat and this is only the, the abbreviated version of my name like my full spelling of my name is o-s-i-t-a-d-i-n-m-a my last name is n-r-i-h-u you fully when you send when you feel you're over, even qualified or overqualified for a job you send your resume in, and you sometimes you get that i wonder if they just looked at the, my name and just i can't pronounce this name i know this person is not the same individual i can't the person's their probably ethnic, not going to be your ethnic is what it is yeah the the ethnicity, yeah. Is yeah 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 not john and smith just, it's something yeah else. so it's just that throw it to the side so there was a point where i had to i abbreviated my middle name and use that as my name to send to job interviews just because it's it it was not as not uncommon for individuals so i could get a shot and then you go into an interview and I mean, the basis of all life is your parents give you your name. That's, that's the starting point of you. The strongest part of the person you become is your name. And then people, they either botch it or they mispronounce it. Like I get Aussie all the time and I'm always like, no, it's OC, Aussie. It's like, where do you get Aussie? I've told you like a thousand times it's OC, get it right. Like if I came up to you, your name was John and I was like, hey, Jay, or like I, I messed up your name. So you're going to feel massively disrespected, right? You're going to be like why are you making fun of me it's like well you do the same thing with my like the strength of the person I, it's my name so get it right just like I would get your name right yes and oftentimes too you find uh what can I call you when you're expected to call them by their yeah. names but they want to call you something other than something your else name. don't accept nothing less than the best you're going to call me my full name to, that's only, the only thing I'm answering to um, so another question is, especially for Tamara and Osi, how do you feel like you're torn in your work life and your personal life being a person of color? Because you're both in, I don't want to call it law enforcement, but it kind of falls under an umbrella of where the people you're working with, you guys are like a, like a core team who consider themselves a family, like a unit, right? How do, how do you differentiate between the two when it comes to certain issues? Like, uh, First of all, yeah, we are actually considered law enforcement. Mm -hmm. You could call it that. Yeah. Uh, it's, um, sometimes you have to learn how to, to, to juggle. It's uh, not something we always discuss publicly because it's uh, different hats that we have to wear. And if we have to be a certain way, then that's, uh, I guess, what we signed up for as part of our profession. It's um, a balancing act. 
OC? <laughs> That's it's a tough question, right? It's uh, you, you can't. You're, I actually say you're running a, it's a, a thin line. Uh, it's just, you're tiptoeing. Um, you want to be the person you want to be, and at the same time, you have to be what is expected of you. So you you just have to be respectful and not losing the person you are when you're you're in that position, right? You still want to be fair in all aspects of it. I know, I know I, I'll just, I had a random conversation with somebody and um, we were speaking to it. I was like, if you had, let's say more blacks higher up or they were like, oh, well, if you were promoted as a black supervisor or whatnot, does that mean you would treat white officers differently than you would treat a black officer? And I was like, no, I would treat everybody the, the exact same. It's not, I'm not gonna, just because of the color of skin is I'm not gonna treat somebody any differently. And it's it's a, a thin line I have to walk between the two. It's a hard one sometimes because you you still want to be yourself and you you, you want you don't uh, it's a tough one to answer. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure anybody you ask in the situation, they'll always have that situation. It's just a hard one to answer because you're forced between, I guess that we're not blue line, but blue line and regular black lives movement and you want you you need to show respect to both sides of it because both sides are the person you are right now yeah yeah understood that is a tough call um how has it changed in your work environment since the whole black lives matter movement started have you seen visible changes uh, for me people are more open to talk about sorry you can go ahead brian I've no no go go go, 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 go please, please 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 go ahead go ahead <laughs> it's I, I love it because now people are, are more open to discussing and I think that's always been the situation the hesitation of the, the situation before when Colin Kaepernick was doing what he was doing before I had people who would be like I wish he'd take it out of football and he'd be like no no it, it needs to be in sports this is how do you ask how do you it shouldn't be in sports and you're just like no this is where it should this is a major part it should start there and it should go further than that and it's we he, as soon as the conversation started, I was like, no, it kind of was a, he faded off, but now he would be willing to engage and have a full-fledged conversation on his viewpoint and my viewpoint on why it should be in sports. Even everything going on right now, it's, it's great. And I can have a conversation with supervisors, with chiefs, with directors about everything going on. They're willing to listen to hear my viewpoint and I can hear their viewpoint. It isn't, it's not an argument right off the bat or um, one of my other coworkers who's doing a massive presentation or who will be doing a massive presentation, he goes, before if it was our viewpoints didn't align, it'd be as simple as me ignoring you, deleting you on social media never talking to you again. Now, if our viewpoints don't align, we at work can have our conversations, get our viewpoints openly communicate between the two of us before we make that quick judgment of, you don't like Colin Kaepernick, done, you're racist. I'm not talking to you anymore. <laughs> Uh, and to continue with that, because we work in the same location, uh, I've noticed that there have been more conversations that have been uh, ar arisen from the whole entire situation that happened last year. Uh, the fact that no, no one can denounce that systemic racism is not a thing that exists in any sort of workplace in Canada. Uh, we might not be as openly racist as you see that in the U.S., uh, but yeah, it does. pockets do exist and it does happen. Uh, here with certain things like microaggressions that are said to me, like I remember I went to a function in Stratford in 2019 I had to go watch a play with uh, the alumni association and I had an incident in the in the gift shop and a microaggression when I asked a woman to see a bracelet uh, behind the glass she's like that's too expensive for you and I was like in absolute disbelief I never mentioned it because like I was having such a great time and then we had lunch afterwards with uh, a lot of the attendees I was like so what does she mean that it was too expensive for me does she even know what I do for work and like what kind of money I really have but I was just like wow thanks Stratford 2019 for ruining my experience but at work we we've had a lot of conversations with other uh, black employees and then I was selected as one of the individuals to help develop anti-black racism training that's going to be delivered once we can start doing in-face training again of course or in-person training again uh, due to the pandemic but I feel really good about the product we hired in a woman who's from uh, Durham College who's a diversity uh 
guru and master that helped us develop this. So I'm really proud of the product we put together. I'm really happy to see that my department is moving forward in, in the proper steps by just starting to deliver training and making amends or somewhat having the conversations now openly instead of saying, oh, it's because of rap culture or whatever the reason someone would say the N word at work. And it's, it was very dismissive before. And I think they realized they can't keep doing that anymore. They have to start making changes. Yeah, and, um, and I'll, I'll be brief here too with MLSE, especially um, with the products that we have that are still like, you know, national or international as well. We definitely have to be more so on the forefront there. So I'm really glad to see some of the um, initiatives that our teams have started, but also looking on the corporate side, uh, it led to the development and creation of our, our equity, uh, diversity and inclusion like department uh, of, our, of our entire company. Um, so as, as tragic as the events over like the last year have been, uh, it has sparked uh, some progress. Now, um, are we done? <laughs> you know what I mean? Is discrimination or racism done? Not by a long shot, but it is good to see uh, progress. Now the real challenge is now, how do we keep it fresh? How do we keep that drive as much as it was last March or April or May, and then keep it um, with the same momentum today? That's the biggest challenge that I've been encountering. Um, I felt over the last like couple of months of just, we got to keep it running. We got to keep it rolling. I agree with that component because even it being Black History Month, a lot of those businesses that were putting up black squares last year, they have nothing to say right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have to just keep an eye out and see what kind of changes are being made. And, you know, yes, we can be a part of the change, but sometimes personally, I don't feel like I should always have to be the one to educate. You know, there are other organizations who can, that can help with that, but Yes, we can still help to be a part of the change and having conversations like these are very important because it gives people a chance to not only get a glimpse of what we have experienced, but there are people out there who've experienced a lot of things who feel like they can't speak about it. And we want to encourage everyone to really start having the conversation and we want to know if you have any questions because we do realize we're over time a bit, but if you have any questions, please put them in the question box. And in the meantime, I would like to ask our panelists for some final words before we share some information of some other upcoming Black History Month events by the Alumni Association. So let's start with Tamara. Uh Funny, we uh, my workplace actually is having a, a really great webinar tomorrow, which is they've hired uh, a professor and a PhD candidate from the University of Windsor, ironically enough, to talk about mental health in the Black community. And I was trying to find what, what her name is, but I'm very excited. I'm hoping I can actually join that um, webinar tomorrow at one o'clock because it's like two parts of my life getting married together with the University of Windsor, my job, having this, plus also mental health in the Black community, which I feel is something that's never really discussed because uh, it's kind of just put under the wayside if someone's not feeling well, you drink tea and pray to Jesus. So mm -hmm. this is going to be a really good session. So I, I'm like my workplace is really starting to do some better events this time. Uh, final words. Uh, first of all, thank you again for hosting this and having us, University of Windsor and of course Duania for, for doing the event and getting um, just some stories out there and having the discussion. Uh, I would say to anyone that is like black racialized, you know, you don't have to take it all on yourself to be the one to educate everybody and have to correct everyone. They can read, they should go be able to look up history themselves. You know what I mean? Like I have to decide when someone makes a comment to me, is it worth the effort to address or do I ignore? Uh, and also just trying to be sensitive to others. Like those of us, those that are non, that are non-racialized look at us and it's, it can be very exhausting. Like the different sort of hats we have to wear and the way that we have to carry ourselves it's always this balancing act that can be very taxing. So asking certain questions or expecting us to be the, the person that's gonna make all the change as one individual is impossible. You need allies to be able to do that too and working together. So be, be cognizant of that when you're talking to someone and like minding your, your words and things that you shouldn't say to somebody. Cause I never ask you, oh my God, is blonde your real hair color? <laughs> because I'm not ignorant like that. It's that certain things you should, just check yourself before you say something and being respectful of everybody. I think that is, again, we have a lot of work to do. Brian, hundred percent agree. Uh, I don't think that in my lifetime, racism is going to be eradicated, but we can work towards some sort of better change for the future and future generations. Well said, well said. O.C. Mary hit all the points there. She had all the keynotes, just uh, communication is a big part of it. And I mean, if, 
you're part of an organization that wants to be part of the change, actually let the change happen. Um, the one thing I feel that might be a hesitation or step back is, yeah, this might be the, it might be a fad, which would be the worst thing ever, but I pray to the Lord that it's not a fad, but when it's put in place, I hope people are willing to accept that change and go with it. Don't, don't make it a, a two steps forward to go like four steps back. I guess is just be part of that change. Agreed, agreed, agreed. Brian. Uh, mine would be a, kind of like a two part kind of messaging. First would be for the people who identify as allies um, and for the change. So, um, you know, obviously keep when marches are allowed to happen again and then protests are allowed to happen again and demonstrations post pandemic, absolutely keep attending, keep, um, you know, showing your support, keep using social media, things like that. But don't let it end there. And, 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 and the, I know that a lot of people feel like, you know, when I have to instill change, it has to be monumental. I, I, I gotta be, you know what I mean? Like, I gotta be, the, I gotta change a thousand people's lives at like at one point or everything like that. But it can be something as simple as challenging a friend that you've known for years who's used a derogatory term or who, or who has stated, um, used, often uses microaggressions, things like that, calling that out, calling out that family member who just says those just wildly offside things at, at a family get together, having the bravery to stand up to that, that instills change as well. That instills um, some sort of progress. So it can be as, as big as organizing a demonstration that takes the convention center. And it can be as, as, as simple as like, Uncle Will, you cannot say that. And you have to stop saying that or, it, you know what I mean? Or this is what happens. So that'd be for the one part. All right, for all of the marginalized groups, BIPOC, everyone there, it's exhausting. I know. And, and, it, and it feels like you're always constantly fighting. But again, um, the change there can be, it can be huge and great and absolute paradigm shifting. It can also be simple of just challenging your friends to be better, challenging people within your inner circle to be better and standing up for yourself. If you feel that something happened to you is not right or is not fair, or, or it's just dehumanizing you have the confidence and the ability to believe in yourself and to stand up in that regard. Wow. I think all these panelists really hit the nail on the head. So I hope you all have some good takeaways. But with that, we also want to share one second. Oh my gosh. Good. Her I name is Renee Taylor, not to cut you off, Dwayne. I found it. Her name is Renee Taylor. <laughs> she's a PhD candidate in the adult clinical psychology at the University of Windsor. And she's talking for my workplace tomorrow via WebEx on Black in the mental health community. Fantastic. <laughs> How are you going to share the information? How can people, if they want to be, if, if, is there a way that they can? Uh, not really. I don't think so. I apologize. <laughs> but yeah, I think she has some information possibly up there online. Uh, but uh, you can probably look her up. She's at the University of Windsor is a, she's going to be speaking about Black uh, mental health. Well, what everyone needs to do is go on Tamara's LinkedIn because she's going to have a list of takeaways from that meeting so that you can. Um... <laughs> 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 That's what everyone's going to do. Um, uh, you know, there's some organizations here in Canada that can be really helpful to people who are either looking for education or, or want to support um, or want to support Black organizations. So there's the Black Mental Health Canada, Inc., which is, I think everyone, uh, Tamara, you addressed, you know, the mental health aspect and, you know, a lot of Black families, like you said, tea and prayers, but the Black Mental Health Canada, Inc., there's the Black Youth Helpline, there's the Black Health Alliance, the Black Legal Action Center, there is BBPA, which is Black Business and Professional Association. I love that organization. And there's the Federation of Black Canadians. So those are just a few organizations that you can tap into for, you know, if you want to look for a place to donate, if you're looking for support, those are some there. And the University of Windsor has uh, coming up tomorrow, they have Celebrating Excellence, a conversation with Brian McBride and Jermaine Franklin. And you can get that information on the website, the same website that you went to in order to find the information for this event. And I'm sure Catherine uh, will have some information that she can send out to everyone here. Um, I don't see any I see thank yous. Uh, there's some thank yous here, everyone, for 
everyone's input and for sharing your experiences. I am very thankful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And it's also nice to see some new alumni faces. <laughs> <laughs> so have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. And uh, Duenia, you have a question that might be a question yeah. there. Oh, I did it? Oh, that wait. came up, yeah. How important do you think mentoring for black students is at the university level? Oh my gosh, that is very important. And that's why even when we talked earlier about the people or teachers who are professors who might have been your support system, that's helpful. But if we as alumni can connect, I believe the University of Windsor has, uh, Catherine, jump in if I don't remember the name of it. I'm gonna apologize in advance. People, I have chemo brain, so I don't remember a lot. I try my best. Um, it's there's it's called co it's a virtual 10, coffee. Yes, ten thousand coffees. There you go. Yes, I'll put that in the follow up, which um, which I was hoping to get an opportunity to just say that we'll do some follow up. We'll send a survey, but we'll include the links that you mentioned, and then we will also include um, the link to ten thousand coffees because absolutely um, alumni mentoring. Uh, young uh, students and making recommendations to the university are all wonderful things so that would be greatly appreciated. Yes, and it's also, it's always better coming from another student where they can feel like they're getting the real deal information um, as opposed to if they, they might feel like they're not getting the same level of information, the real information, if they go through different avenues, right? Where their guidance counselors, I don't know what it's like in high school here, like guidance counselors or whatever their parents or parents' friends might say, but as an alumni, it's always good to have that connection with students who are looking for universities to attend or students who are just starting and they want to find ways to navigate the system. I hope that answered your question. If anyone else wants to jump in, that's fine. That question was from Jamie. Okay, um, we got some thank yous, thank yous, thank yous, and thank you everyone again. Um, yeah, this was fun. Just a little Thursday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all for, uh, for hosting this. Uh, and like you said, I hope this leads to either like, you know, a series or, or continued conversations um, in the future, um, not only just for Black History Month, but even um, outside of that and beyond. So um, really happy to be yeah. here as an honor. And uh, thank you so much. All right. Yes, thank you. Thank, you, thank you for inviting me for this. Have a Great good stuff. one, everyone. Thank, yeah, you thanks, too. everyone. Inviting me. Thank you.